Are you ready to be moved today? I've come with a message. I didn't know until midnight last night, and I was already asleep, but I, I, I woke, kind of rolled over, deciding what I was going to share today. So there's something for you. It's going to change your life. Father God, anoint this and bless it in Jesus' name, and everybody can say amen. amen. I feel really strongly that the body of Christ has to go back to the Word of God. We've gotten away from it. I don't care to hear people get up in the morning, a pastor to say, I'm gonna talk about love today. Here's my idea of love. Bless your heart, I love it, but I don't wanna know your idea of love. I wanna know the Bible's idea of love. That's what I wanna know. Now see, we gotta be aware that in the last days, Paul said, he said in the last days, they will not endure sound doctrine, but they will heap for themselves teachers that'll say what they wanna hear. Whoa. Now, in that phrase, endure sound doctrine, does that tell you something? Endure it. And then he says in that passage too, to rebuke and correct and whatever, whatever. Now, in California, I felt led to go back to doing something that I built the church on there. I built the church on verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. And then I got away from it, so we're back now. And what happens is I do the first and second service verse-by-verse -verse Bible study. My son does the third service. And that's the way we've been regulating that. So over there, what we did is we started a Bible study in the book of 1 Peter. And we're going verse by verse and just tearing the book apart. Now, I'm gonna highlight some of that first chapter with you today, some things that I think you need to know. First of all, Peter wrote the book of Peter. Does that, that make sense? Do you know how many liberal theologians say that he didn't write it? They say that Peter did not write the book because he was uneducated and not scholarly enough to have written that letter. They said he was just a fisherman. No way, they say, too articulate for Peter. I wonder, have those liberal theologians ever read Acts 4.13? What does Acts 4.13 say? It says, now as they observed the confidence of Peter and John and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Let's look at that same verse in the Message Bible if we can. It says, they couldn't take their eyes off of them, Peter and John standing there so confident, so sure of themselves. Their fascination deepened when they realized these two were laymen with no training in scripture or formal education. They were recognized and they recognized them as being companions of Jesus. I believe Peter wrote the book, why? Because he said he did. Can we just settle it right there? He said he did. In the first verse, it says he wrote it. Does the Bible lie? I want to ask those liberal theologians. I mean, if someone else wrote the book, then that other person was a liar, and if a liar wrote the book, it's probably full of lies, right? Doesn't make sense. I also believe he wrote it, but I believe that he had help writing it. When you go to write a book, you always get people to help you write the book. That's what you do. I know when I write a book, I have one person that checks my grammar. I have two other people that read through the book to make sure there's no you know, grammatical mistakes in there or whatever. I have another person to edit it. Well, these liberal theologians, I don't know what they're thinking, but have they ever read chapter five and verse 12? He tells you, look. It says, through Sylvanius, our faithful brother, for I regard him so, I've written to you briefly. He said, I did it through Sylvanius. Sylvanius, I mean, it's all right there. I get so mad at these liberal theologians. Going, you got it. You're not even thinking, are you? If he didn't write the book that a liar wrote it, if a liar wrote it, get it out of the canon. And so it's right there. He wrote the book. Now, let's just dive in. And I'm gonna look at some of the verses. And the verses I'm gonna look at today have, a, have the ability to change your lives. First of all, I'm not gonna read the first verse, but the first verse, it says that he's written to the chosen the chosen people. Now, I have a big problem with Reformed theology. I always will. I'll go to my grave having a problem because in their belief system, before the earth, before people were born, God looked down and said, I'll choose you, you, you to live with me in heaven and you, 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 you will burn in hell. And that's before people were born. And they have no choice. They have no choice whatsoever. They cannot accept. I mean, if you weren't chosen before, the, then, then you can't go to heaven. 
That is ludicrous. What, what are we thinking? You can't be the God of that belief and the God of love too. You can't be. I shared with you before, it's, it's like tantamount to a story of a guy, farmer, driving down the road in a tractor and there's a, a house on fire. There are five teenage boys in there and he stops and he goes, I'll save you and you. Other three, you're gonna burn to death. Now the bad part about that story is the farmer started the fire in the first place. Makes it even worse. See, the God of love, if he looked down, and because of divine sovereignty, they say if you're chosen by God before you were born, then obviously he's gonna make you love him. You'll love him. It's automatic you're gonna love him. I mean, it's just gonna happen. He's sovereign. You're gonna love everything that happens in your life's gonna be sovereignly directed. A God of love, if he was that kind of God, is to look it down and say, I'll choose you, you. He would just choose everybody. That's what he would do. Now, in school, in elementary school and junior high, uh, we used to do something that was really, really bad. I hope they don't still do it today. But for PE, we'd play competitive sports and we'd choose six or seven of the good athletes and they'd be captains and, and the captain, you'd choose people. All the other kids would line up. You'd say, I'll choose you. I'll choose Jeffrey. I'll choose Sally. I'll choose them. And there's always five kids sitting there left going, so sad. I hope they don't still do that. Well, God chose his team, but you know what God said? How many want to be on my team? Everybody goes, me, me, me. He said, I choose all of you who want to be on my team. Come on, you're on my team. That's what he did. And of course, he can see ahead. He can look ahead of time and see who chooses him and who doesn't. He can, because he sees the future, he knows. But God said, if you want to be on my team, I choose you. You want to be on my team? Yes. Chuck Smith used to say it so well. He said, you know what? God chooses people to love him. He said, well, I don't think that's fair that God chooses. He said, then why don't you choose God today and then it shows you're chosen. And maybe I don't want to choose God, then you're not chosen. But I don't think it's fair. Well, choose him and you're chosen. You know, it's real easy. That was wisdom of Chuck Smith. I love it. Now, uh, he was called to be an apostle. You know, you all should have two things in your life, a career and a calling. In your career, you get paid a check at the end of the month. In your calling, you get a reward at the end of your life. But you should have both. You should have both. Now, let's look at verse two. It says, you were chosen according to the foreknowledge of God. God knows who's gonna choose him, the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit. And the sanctifying work of the Spirit causes you to obey Jesus Christ, or it's related to obeying Jesus Christ and grace will be yours in the fullest measure. Now, when you get saved, we've all been called to a process called sanctification. What is sanctification? Well, when I was 20 some years old, God gave me this in my sleep at night, and I didn't know then, and you've heard it if you've been with me any length of time, a red ball of Play-Doh and a blue ball. Every person on the earth is born into sin. They're a red ball of clay. The very name Adam means red. I didn't know that when God gave me this illustration. Blue in the, in the Jewish mind means something divine coming out of heaven. So everybody's born in sin, the red ball of clay. When you are born again, the blue ball comes down and joins the red ball, then the process of sanctification starts. Being molded, the two together, the spirit and the flesh. Now, the more you're molded together, the more you'll become purple. Purple's a brand new color. Purple's divine. So the more you're meshed together, the more purple you become, the more like Christ you are. And so the process, and then again, I've told you before, that, that God was a, oh, what a great thing when he gave me this illustration. It explains so many things. Because the Pentecostals say you can lose your salvation. The Baptists say you can't lose your salvation. They're both right, they're both wrong. Because eternal security doesn't come until you can't separate the blue from the red. At a certain point in sanctification, you become eternally secure. No man knows when that is. You will know. Like a lot of you here today, you're, you've been sanctified and you couldn't walk away from God if you wanted. Both my kids said one day, my daughter, uh, Tara, Pastor Jim's wife, and Josh, uh, she said that, that we, we saw too much and, and knew too much. Dad prayed for us so much in the home, we could never walk away. So Hebrew says that you can taste you can be made partakers of the Holy Spirit, taste the good gift, and then depart. See, when that blue first joins the red, you can pull that apart. But after sanctification for a while, it starts to come purple. And there's a point where you can't separate anymore. That's when you're eternally secure. Now, 
For example, me. See, see, the Bible says that we're predestined to be conformed to the image of Jesus. I'm not the same person I was five years ago, 10 years ago, 20, 30 years ago. I'm not the same guy. I'm different. For example, as I grow in Christ, I become more of a shepherd's heart. I feel so bad. I know this has a lot to do with personalities, but probably 40 years ago, I asked God, I said, I, I saw a pastor crying on TV all the time, and I don't know if it was real or not, but I said, God, I want to grow to a point where I, I hurt so bad that I cry. I want to actually cry, because I, I never could shed tears. I, and my mother died. I, I mean, I just, I, I don't shed tears. And I prayed that prayer, not sure I should have. Now I watch movies. My wife's sitting there eating popcorn. I'm sitting there crying. <laughs> it's horrible. It's embarrassing. She said, you like that movie? And I'm sitting there going, uh, yeah, I thought it was a great movie. <laughs> hunting. I, I like to hunt. And, but I used to like to hunt anything. I just shoot stuff to kill it. I can't do that anymore. I just can't. I mean, if I'm going hunt with somebody and they really need the food, I can kill it if they're going to eat it, I guess. But, but my heart's saying, lust, I don't see lust the way I used to. I see these young women, now I see my granddaughters and my daughters and stuff. It's just, I'm changed. I'm not the same person. Now, don't get discouraged if you're not there at that place of growth because we're all growing. We're all different levels of growth. Some of us are more purple than others. And I, those of us that are more purple than the younger Christians, we gotta be patient with one another. I did a lot of stupid things my first 20 years of Christianity. I still can't believe I did them. I used to work out a lot, man, get my arms real big, and I'd go to the women's store and buy women's dress because they, they, they made me look more buffed. <laughs> I still can't believe I did that. One day, a lady saw me and said, I know that, 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 that T-shirt you have on. That's at Petri's. They sell that at Petri's. And I go... <laughs> I, if you want to get into it, I'll tell you a bunch of stupid stuff I did in my first 20 years of Christianity. But you know what? People were patient with me. They didn't run me off. They knew I was growing. Now, again, we gotta understand that, keep that in our mind. People are gonna come in here that are different levels of Christianity. They're different levels of, of being like Christ. And we all, we're family. I uh, brought a, an employee over here and he was kind of a newer Christian and, and uh, some years ago, and there was a free show at Rio. I don't know if they still have it. And Christmas time, all the lights. I said, let's go watch this free show and we're standing there. And these girls come out and they were dressed pretty scantily, which didn't bother me, but I looked over at him and he was going, I said, hey, let's go get lunch, okay? Let, let's just don't watch any more of this. We, you know, I'm hungry anyway, aren't you hungry? You know. Uh, so uh, I told you, and I don't want to offend you with this, but that's just, I just tell stuff like it is. I was preaching a while back in California. We have two campuses in Bakersfield. We got the doctors and lawyers go to one and, and we got this real rough crowd that comes to the big one. And one day I was preaching and this guy got so inspired. He said, hey, pastor said, preach that S-H-I. He yelled it out. And everybody went, did he just say that? But he didn't know. I saw the guy. He got saved two months earlier. That's the way he talked. He didn't know. Another time I was preaching, a guy yelled out, hey, pastor, hell no, we wouldn't do that. And everybody again stopped and went, they're not trying to be cute. They just got saved out of the world. They, that's the way they express themselves. This dude was genuinely excited about what I was teaching. And every summer, I get people come to me and go, pastor, you need to talk to these people after church and tell them about the dress code as Christians. And I go, I'm not gonna do that. I had a real religious guy one day, very, he came from another church, he's pastor. You're gonna have to talk to this congregation. A guy sitting in front of me today with a beer shirt on. It was advertising beer. I said, so what? He was a church, wasn't he? Come on. I'm not gonna embarrass some little girl out there because she has shorts on and go talk to her. You need to start, you know, I'm not gonna do that. If it bothers you, just move to the other side of the church. You got 3,400 seats, you can move somewhere. Uh, here in Vegas, we used to go on the rescue mission, and one day, I got there kind of late, and the guys were all outside, I said, Pastor, we're gonna talk, come here, come here, come here. I said, you know, that gal that got saved last week, she's out here, and look at her top, man, it's low, she's so unclean, we need to talk to her. I said, no one's gonna talk to her. She was saved a week ago, this is her first time. You think those homeless people haven't seen this before? Come on, they're in Vegas. I said, this is her first time out. If she keeps doing it, maybe several weeks down the road, we'll take her side and talk. But at least she's out here trying to do something with her life today. Don't you run her off. Don't you run her off. 
I mean, again, I gotta keep myself in mind. I did stupid things, but people gave me time to grow. Now, this is gonna get better, it's gonna get better. You wanna know, you, you can cooperate with this sanctification process. You can make it go faster, this, this blue and red. You can really, and, and when it changes who you are, it's gonna change everything about your life. But you can promote sanctification. How do you do it? First of all, every time you say yes to the spirit and no to the flesh, you become more purple. That'll speed up your purple process. Let's say your friends get together and say, we've all got RVs, and twice a month we're going camping for the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Will you go with us? And you respond by saying, I'd love to. I'll go with you on vacation, but... I can't miss church twice a month. You've responded in the spirit and not the flesh and that will increase your purple. It'll increase the process. Every time you're watching TV or whatever and this voice says, turn the channel, turn the channel, but you're into it. When you obey the spirit and not the flesh, you're gonna grow. You're gonna grow. When you give money and you don't wanna give that's part of becoming more purple when you obey the spirit instead of the flesh. I told you I was going up to Fresno some years ago, and I probably told you this story, but I was going up to pray for a baby that was dying. Stopped by McDonald's to get a muck something. And so as I'm in line to order my muck stuff, a lady behind me started a conversation with me and come to find out she was a Christian. I told her I was a pastor. She says, where are you going, Pastor? And I said, I'm going up to pray for a baby that's dying. Oh, let's pray right now. And she's a re real deal, right? And so we're praying at McDonald's. And, and so after we get through, I said, what are you doing? She says, well, I have to take a morning extra job because my kids don't have coats and winter's coming. And uh, so I go deliver papers in the morning. I said, okay, great. And I walked away and God said, give her $80, $40 a child. Give it to her for the coat. And I, I love money and I loved it more then than I do now. And I didn't really want to do it. But it kept coming, coming, coming. Finally, I, I get my meal and I pray over and I say, Father God, if she's still there when I get through eating, I'll, I'll, I know it's you, but she's gotta still be there and I eat real slow. <laughs> she's still there. I went over and said, ma'am, I gotta obey the spirit. I said, here's $40 to get your kids some coats. And I walked away and God said, I said 80, I said 80, not 40. I went back and said, I'm so sorry. I was supposed to give you 40 a kid. <laughs> but when we obey the spirit, Every time you take the short end of the stick for the kingdom of God and you apologize, you, you, you become more purple. So every week, the Spirit's testing us. Will you obey the flesh or the Spirit? Every time you obey the Spirit and say no to the flesh, you're becoming more purple. So we cooperate with the sanctification process. It's part of the curriculum. Now notice in verse two that he does tie together sanctification with obedience. Uh, and I give you many more ways that we're sanctified, but they're tied together. Now let's go on and look at what it says in verse five. It says, we're protected by the dunamis power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now there's two meanings of this verse. Obviously the primary meaning is we're saved spiritually for the coming of the Lord, but I believe there's a second meaning. And we're also saved in a very practical way by the power of God through faith in this world. See, can I tell you something? God wants you to live your days out. It's important to him that you live your days out. They're numbered. But some of you, if you don't listen to God and obey by faith what he's telling you, you'll short circuit those numbers. And you'll die for your time. I really believe that with all of my heart. I'll give you a radical example. Uh, back years ago, we had these offices down in Bakersfield in a very shady, bad area of town. And one night I was preparing a sermon and I had to go get a book from these offices downtown to share as an illustration. It was like 11 at night. And I drive down there and pitch dark. These offices were dark. One little porch light, that's it. And I, I, I know some of you find this hard to believe, but this is the way I've walked with God for 50 years. I go to get out of my car and I feel this conviction and voice going, don't, don't go, don't go, don't go in there, don't go in there. And I, I step back and I go, what? I try to go again and it's conviction, don't go, don't go, don't go. And so 15, 20 minutes I stood there going, God, why can't I go in those offices? I don't get it. I believe in you and I'm obeying you in faith, but I gotta get in there. And as I continue to pray, some dude jumped out of the bushes about this far from the door. He'd been there the whole time. He would have got me when I went in. And he took off running. God says, now you can go in. See, I was protected by the power of God through faith. 
When God told me, he didn't tell you this because I've seen God heal people with chemotherapy, so don't take this as a blanket clause. But when God told me to throw away all my chemotherapy at a time when it was the only thing keeping me alive, that was a very, very defining moment. I had nothing else keeping me alive and God told me to throw it away and I threw it all away. You know the story, I won't bore you with it again. Tremendous God story, how he told me that. But see, I was protected by the power of God through acting on my faith. And I give you, I got a bunch of examples written down here, but I won't bore you with those. You get the idea. It's so important that we allow God to change us. The more purple we become, the closer to God we'll become. And so we've got to work with this sanctification process. Look at Romans 8, 29. It says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, Jesus, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. We're predestined, it's part of the curriculum. And I'm gonna say more about it as we go on. God is not comfortable letting you stay as you are. He wants to change you every year, every year, until you become more like Christ. That leads us right into chapter one, verse six and seven. It says, in this, you don't just rejoice, you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, hold on to that phrase, you have been distressed by various trials so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold which is perishable even though tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, listen to me closely. What a countercultural thing to say. Count it joy when you encounter trials. But the thing about it is Peter isn't the only one that said it. James said it too. Look what James said. James said, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And man, when you get endurance down and let it have its perfect result, you will be perfect, complete, and you won't lack in a single thing. But not only did James and Peter believe it, Paul believed it. Look what Paul wrote. He said, therefore, I'm well content. I'm well content. I, 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 I welcome weaknesses, insults, distresses, persecutions, difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I meet weak, then I'm strong. Hello, let me ask you, what did they know that we don't? Most American Christians don't rejoice when, when the husband says, I'm leaving you. Ha ha, praise the Lord, you know. <laughs> You're fired. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Why do you say that? Because either he's got a better job for me or he's going to make you change your mind. You know, whatever. What a way to live. See, they saw it differently than we do. What I'm going to say in the next 10 minutes now is going to change your life. You'll listen. Listen closely. Let me give you five things a problem, a trial, or tribulation does to benefit our walk with God. And you'll see, and you'll see it differently. Number one, they show us where we need to grow at. I have truck drivers almost running me off the road every, every week. I don't live in Bakersfield, I live high up in a mountain community. And we have guard, it's a really cool community. We've got lakes and elk and everything, really cool. I live up there. So I have to drive the freeway a lot. And God continues, I feel like God's told me, I'm gonna let those truck drivers pull in front of you and run until you get this down. Because when they do, I go, what do you think you're doing? Ah, nobody behind me, look. You know, I get all upset. I told you one day I was driving down the road, my wife is with me and God was dealing with me about my my road thing. See, I, I'm, 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 I'm old, but I drive really fast. <laughs> when I'm 90, see, you're still see me, I'm gonna come right past you, man. That's just what I do. And I sit there driving along, listening to my music, talking to my wife, some dude comes along and flips me off. What? So I'm now doing 70, 80, I trump. What are you doing? So I'm gonna get up there, me and him's gonna have a talk. I wanna know why he flipped me off, man. And Debbie says, is that what Jesus would do? I said, he might, <laughs> don't know. Nothing in scripture, but he might. I just want to talk to the guy, Debbie. He said, baloney, you don't want to just talk to him. I borrowed this from an acquaintance of mine, another pastor, but he talked about when he went to visit a pottery maker one day who, it was in the old, he had the old fashioned way of doing it. He didn't have the stoves with a the thermostat and everything, but they put the pottery in and, and then he would take it out when it was done. And he said, how do you know when it's done? He said, well, I thump it. And if it goes thump, then it's not done. And I keep doing that thump until someday I thump and it goes ding. 
thing, then I know it's done. He says, that's like us. God puts us in the fire. We start griping. I cannot believe this. Da, 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 da. He takes us out, puts us back in. Takes us out again. And we go, I, I still think this is stupid. He puts us back in. He keeps doing it. So one day he thumps us. We go, hallelujah. He's okay. No more fire. No more fire. You're done with that fire. It's worked. See, when you put a tea bag in hot water, you find out what's in the tea bag, don't you? When you squeeze a tube of toothpaste, you find out what's in the tube. What's in comes out. I don't know if I told you this or not, because it was a couple months ago, but Debbie and I had a disagreement, and I was really mad at her. She did something that I did not like. I thought it was wrong. And so I was kind of mad for the day, and some of you, unfortunately, know what this is like, and I had a very immature moment. And she said, you want to eat? And I said, not really. Are you hungry? Maybe. I'll get something myself. Went on for 10 hours, really childlike, childish, I should say. And so I went to get in my car. It was something small she did. And I'm not kidding, that parable came out of nowhere. It was God. It was as strong as God moments I've ever felt. Out of nowhere comes this parable of a, a rich, of a master who called his slaves in to, to deal with them. And the first one, he says, man, you know what? You owe me a large amount. You owe me 10,000 talents. Pay up or I'm gonna throw your wife, family in jail. And this guy says, please, please don't throw me in jail, please. I know I owe you a lot. I know I do and I'm sorry and I'll repay you if you just give me time. He said, okay, I'm gonna raise the debt. I'm gonna let you go. But that same guy went out and found a guy that owed 100 denarii, which was a lot less. And he said, hey, pay up or I'm gonna throw your family. I'm gonna sell them. I'm gonna sell them, sell them into the marketplace. And he said, but I beg you, give me mercy. Give me, he said, no, I'm not doing it. I'm gonna sell them, man. And God said, you're that person in the parable. And man, I'm telling you, it was a conversation that was so real. He said, do you know what I've forgiven you for? Remember the times you were unfaithful to your wife where you were saved? Remember all the stuff I've forgiven you for? And Ron Vietti, you have the audacity to hold this small thing over her head? You have the, after I forgave you for all that stuff, I turned right around and went home. I said, babe, I am so sorry. She said, what took you so long? As soon as you got in that car, I said, God, you worked that man over. He's being unfair with me. <laughs> she's more godly than me. I'm gonna tell you now. I'm the pastor, but she's more godly. She has my number in prayer. Now, the story in the Bible, let me give you the second one. The second thing trials and tribulations will do, they'll move you into God's will. If you're on beat road B and he wants you in road A, he'll cause things to go wrong on that road to move, to move you. There's a story in the Old Testament about a, a very wicked king in Israel named Ahab. And because of his wickedness, God said, I'm gonna send a drought on the earth. And so he sent Elijah to Ahab to tell him there's gonna be a drought in the earth and it won't change until God says differently. But he tells Elijah, he says, I want you to go hide yourself by the brook Cherith. And he said, there I've commanded the ravens to feed you. Huh? Is that crazy? He commanded the ravens to feed him. And that's the same God we still serve today. He said, so you can drink of the brook and the ravens will feed you. But pretty soon he's smack dab in the center of God's will. The brook cherries start drying up. What? And pretty soon it was dry. Why? Because God wanted him to go 100 miles away to a different place called Zarephath because a woman there needed ministry. I mean, that's what God does. So it's part of his curriculum. Uh, let's make this practical. I did Wednesday nights for years in California and all of a sudden they started becoming a drudgery and oh, I hated Wednesday nights. I told my wife for three or four months I'd drive down for Wednesday nights and I'd go, I hate them. I don't wanna be doing them anymore. I hate these, I hate them, I hate them, Debbie. I don't wanna do them. And it's because he wanted the younger guys doing them. He wanted me out of the way. See, uh, like right now, I'm praying over Vegas a lot because I, I know that, that there's a succession plan in California. Younger guys are coming up. I got 45 young guys that can preach like crazy now. They're good. And so I keep telling God, what about Vegas? Can I just move to Vegas? Can I do something there? You know, I, I still have a lot of ministry. I'm gonna die in ministry and I'm never gonna stop. My son told me the day, he said, Dad, I'm gonna retire you. I said, what does that mean, Josh? He said, it means that I'm gonna let you do what, I only want you to do what you wanna do. He said, I'll make sure that your salary's still there and everybody just do what you want to do. I had a pretty cool plan. I can go for that because I'll work 40 hours a week no matter where. But see, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. Let me ask you a question. Where in life is your brook drying up at? 
God wants to move you. He wants to do something. The third thing trials do is they produce endurance in us. This is a big point to see. Remember what James said? He said they come to produce endurance. Now, what time did we start? 10, 15? Is that when we started the service? So, okay, all right. Uh, to produce endurance. God wants us to learn a very valuable lesson in life, and that is that he doesn't move according to our time schedule. He doesn't. Uh, when Elijah prayed for rain, God couldn't produce that rain on his first prayer or his second prayer or his third, fourth, fifth. It went down the line, right? And God was trying to show Elijah right then and there that it takes time to form clouds. They don't get formed overnight. God could do it that way, but he normally doesn't. And, and God wants us to learn this lesson God told David, you're gonna be a king, but there is a big time element between that promise and him actually getting the throne. Joseph, you're gonna be a ruler of God's people, but there was a big time frame between the fulfillment of that promise and the promise itself. God wants us to learn something. When he gives us a promise, he will fulfill it. But it probably won't be in your time schedule. It takes time to change hearts. You, you say, man, my spouse has left me, but God's told me he's gonna restore this marriage. He's given me a promise. He's confirmed it twice. Then he'll do it. But it might not happen tomorrow. Your faith is gonna be tested in between time. My boss, man, I know it's God's will for me to have a raise, and I've been praying, praying. It's gonna take time for God's to change that heart of that boss, but give him time. Now, now this gets better. Listen to me. It's so important that we learn this. Don't stop believing in the promise. Because if you stop believing, you'll start doing stuff that will sabotage the promise. You get what I'm saying? For example, if your spouse has left you, for somebody else maybe even, but you say, man, I prayed, I know it's God's will to restore this marriage, he's confirmed it twice, then you gotta keep believing and keep praising God. Because if you don't and you throw the towel in, you'll start suing her, taking her to court, then you've ruined the promise. Do you see what I mean? You've ruined it. And so the apostle's saying here, you're gonna learn through endurance. Every trial comes, God wants you to wait it out. Keep telling people, when, when I was dying of cancer, I told people, I said, you know, it hasn't happened yet, it's been a year or two, but God still said I'm not gonna die. And you're gonna see it happen. I don't know when, but you're gonna see it, because he said it, confirmed it two times, I know it's his will. So if we don't endure through trials, we'll start doing stupid things. God told you, you're gonna get a raise, you're gonna get a raise, get a raise. Now, if you don't believe that and keep rejoicing and being nice to your boss and you do something stupid like quitting or cussing him out or chewing him, then you're gonna thwart God's promise. You got a part to play in this. Keep believing, keep believing. Now, this is crazy. Lady in Mulahe, I told you a while back, and I just repeat it for the sake of this illustration, but this lady... I told you that we were driving around Mulahe one day, hundreds of houses, and we knew God told us to build a house. And we were driving along, praying in the spirit, praying, praying, down the street, past house, 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 house. Finally, we come down the street, and I go, oh, stop. Pastor Jim was with me, and a bunch of guys, about eight, 12 of us. I said, hey, is anybody witnessing that God's saying to build a house here? Yeah, I was feeling that too. Right here, you think? Let's pray right now. Yeah, God says to build it here. So we, the lady wasn't even there. We just started building a new house for her. We built it, and she came home, and while we were building it, some dude came over, and he goes, why are you building that house for her? Which because God told us to. She says, this is crazy. He said, for two years, we've been telling her to build a house. She keeps saying, God told me he's gonna build me a house. God told me he's gonna build me a house. And we built out. Is this a fun life or what? See, but she just kept believing, she kept believing. There was no time frame on it. She just said, God told me it's gonna happen. And I gotta go real quick, so we're almost out of time. But number four is it'll make us stronger people. We have such a weak generation today. I mean, we haven't raised a young group of strong people. That's why there's so many suicides in the United States today. A lot of the young people we're raising, they can't, they can't, they can't endure anything. They're not strong on the inside. We've got to produce strong children. Can, can I say something to some of you parents right now? I, if, if a shoe fits, wear it. 
But stop bailing your kids out of every problem they encounter. You're doing them an injustice. Instead of bailing them out, walk with them through it with Jesus. And you'd be smart. See, if an angel appeared to you today and told you, said, you know what? Here's the deal. I'm gonna show you your child's next 50 years and you have the permission to take any three bad events you want out of that child's life. Remove them right now. Inevitably, you'd probably remove the three very things God was gonna use to make them a better Christian and a stronger person. You'd remove the wrong things. My parents would have removed leukemia out of my life and that would have been a terrible mistake because that death sentence changed me in so many ways. I needed that to happen. And then the last one is trials help us relate to others better. Help us relate to others better. In the body of Christ, everybody's been through something. You're going through cancer? Hey, I got a guy right here who's been through two cancers and he's gonna talk to you about how God let him through. You lost a child, I am so sorry, but here's somebody over here who's lost a child. They're gonna show you how God let them through it. And so we can relate. We have to go through the same trials they go through. Can I tell you something? It's gonna be hard to digest for some of you. But for growing Christians, every problem you encounter, God's main purpose for that problem is to show his glory through it and show the world what a big God you have. Once you get that down, you'll say, problems, come on, come on. Let's just show God more glory. Come on, come on, come on. I'm going through a problem right now and it's a pretty, pretty big one. And only my eldership knows about it. But I told him I was gonna tell the congregation. So I said, I want, to, I, want to, I want them to walk through a God problem with me. I, want, I don't want to tell them after the fact. And they all said, not nah, a good idea. They said, but instead video every aspect of this problem and time date every one of them. And then when God does the miracle, then you come out and show them the video. And because I die, he's going to do it. God's going to do another miracle. That's really pretty crazy. And so, man, I have so much more to say. Ah, did I skip over half my sermon? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> last we're out of time, but I want to show you something. In our first chapter, there's, a, there's two or three places where he talks about the return of Christ. Jesus is coming back. I'm going to tell you out and out. He's coming back. And it's going to be soon. Because the birth pangs started some decades ago. Unbelievable. There's going to be a mark of the beast where you can't buy or sell without it. I never dreamed that could take place until our governor in California a while back said, if you don't have a, a proof of the vaccination, you will not be able to come in here and buy anything. And some of you owners will not be able to sell if you don't have the proof of that. And regardless of what you think, I'm not political at all. I'm just saying basically that the day is here. The day is here. Mm. Now, Christmas is coming. And on the first Christmas, they were shocked when the baby Jesus was actually born. They had heard that Messiah was gonna be born so many times they'd become numb to it. When he actually showed up there, like nobody was expecting it except three wise men. They were the only ones expecting it. Because somewhere Daniel down through the ages, I mean, these wise men live in Babylonia, the area where Daniel was in captivity at. Daniel passed along all this information to their forefathers. They passed it down. These three wise men in Daniel chapter nine, they were told when Messiah would come. If you, I've, done the, I've done the numbers for, I can do them for you sometime on the screen, but they said, when you see King Artaxerxes give the command to go rebuild the city, know that there's this many years and Messiah will be here and I can get it right to the T. We can take those years, I'll show you right to the T. He came at that time, unbelievable. And so these three wise men, they, they knew the signs of the times. They were waiting. So when that star came, they go, this is the time. Look right here. This is the time. They had it all. They, they were expecting him. How many Christians are really expecting the Lord today? Really expecting him. I mean, well, the signs are all there. I mean, we've got, I, I, I write down 20 different signs. And then lately, have you heard the latest? The government has appointed a UFO task force. The government appointed it. The government. They said, we've had so many UFO sightings and they're increasing so much. We know there's something to them. We just can't figure it out yet. These crafts that these aliens are flying or whoever, 
have been clocked at 43,000 miles per hour. And they stop and start on a dime. Tell me, what in the physical realm can do that? Nothing. There's something going on. You can read this. It's all over the news. They've appointed a task force. They got to find out what's going on, who we've been visited by, what's going on. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This fits into a Bible prophecy. Are you ready for this? I mean, grab a hold of your chair right now. Hold on tight. Because when I come back next month, I'm going to talk to you about it maybe. <laughs> I ain't going to talk to you about it right now. Because I'm out of time. Jesus is coming back. And it's time to either get right or get left. So we got to get back to the Word of God. There's only one type of Christian that my Bible describes. Only one type. That's the people who have made Jesus master, owner, and Lord. If Jesus can't be number one in your life, he doesn't want to be anything at all. Nothing. Nothing. He's number one or nothing. Now you can have number two love, number three, number four. I do. I have a lot of stuff I love, you know, but Jesus is number one. And so if you're here today and you've never been born again, it's real simple. Just somewhere today, get along and just say, God, I'm tired of living for me. I want to become your kid. Holy Spirit, I invite you to come and live in my body and start messing with stuff. I give you my life today. You know what your part is? Just keep going to church, reading your Bible and praying. He'll do all the rest. He'll start action. We're in a part that I didn't get to share today in the Bible study where it said, in Peter, it says now because of the sanctification, the trials and all the stuff God's gonna be doing, Peter says, prepare your mind for action. There's gonna be action going on. He's gonna be moving all the time, all the time, all the time. Every time I, I, I now I watch a TV program and it gets bad, I know God's saying, this is a test. This is a test. You're going to turn the channel? If I am tempted by something today, I'll hear God, it's a test. It's a test. Are you going to do the right thing? And the more I do the right thing, the more I get purple. New creature in Christ. I got so much more to say. Is it hot in here to be you? I mean, is it, whew, I am sweating, guys. I don't know who's the thermostat person, but maybe you can kind of chill that out a little bit. It's, Love you guys. Me and Jim spent the whole Thanksgiving talking about how much we love the Vegas church. And both of us said, man, is that a special group or what? You guys are special. Never quite seen a group like you. Our heart's with you. We know you're going through praying about buildings and all that. And our heart is right here with you. And pray for me that I'll know what place I play in this as the years go. So... That's all I'm going to say. Love you. See you here, there, in the air. God bless. Hey, church family. We're so glad you stopped by to check out this video today. Before you go, we just want to share a few things with you. If this is your first time checking us out online, I want to encourage you to head to valleyvegas.org. You can see all of our upcoming events. You can see all the life groups you can get plugged into. And you can also see all the ministry opportunities we have going on at our church. Also, if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do that by heading to valleyvegas.org slash give. While it's awesome that we can meet and have church right here like this, we would love to see you here on campus with us. Want to let you know our service times, which are 9 a.m., 10, 15, 11, 45 a.m. on Sundays, as well as a 7 p.m. service on Wednesdays. We hope to see you online or in person again real soon. God bless. Yeah.